Uh, good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by Government Medical Officers Association and Sri Knowledge Academy. Today there will be two lectures and our topics are going to be on life-threatening medical emergencies, not to be missed by a doctor, and approach to common medical emergencies in emergency department. Before we start, I would like to thank Dr. Indika Lenaroy, consultant emergency physician at National Hospital Sri Lanka, and Dr. Nandana Jayatilaka, consultant emergency physician at Teaching Hospital Peradeni for coordinating this program. Kindly mute your microphones and your cameras during the presentation and use a chat box to clear your doubts at the, at the end of every session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tushara Vidana Patirana, Consultant Emergency Physician currently attached to District General Hospital, Madhara, and his lecture is going to be on life-threatening emergencies not to be missed by a doctor. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. So, um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tushara Vidana Patirana, uh, Consultant Emergency Physician attached to District General Hospital, Madhara. Today, I'm going to discuss a uh, few important uh, emergencies uh, with higher possibility of missing uh, by uh, doctors. And I especially, I want to give you attention, particularly on these emergencies, if it presented to you as a first contact person. So most of, uh, actually, uh, I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, most of you, you all are working as uh, general practitioners and um, uh, others are working at uh, other trainee positions. Um, so if generally, uh, if patient presented to you, uh, if you missed this kind of diagnosis and if patient end, uh, ended up with uh, devastating consequences, you may need to face a lot of issues. Um, so first thing is impact on patient, other thing is uh, effect on uh, your GP practice or um, uh, this may be highlighted in social media which may create bad image on you. So <clears throat> therefore I wanted to highlight these specific topics for you all. Um, I'm not going for a conventional uh, presentation. I'm going, I'm going to discuss few cases presented to me. Um, the first case I'm going to discuss is a 33 years old patient presented with urinary incontinence while at sleep. Mother noted noisy breathing when he was at bed. He was rigid. Um, complain of tongue bite late and uh, once he regained the consciousness and uh, he was fully conscious at the time of presentation to me. Uh, he was well, very well before uh, going to bed. Uh, no significant past medical history, no alcohol or drug use. His clinical examination was unremarkable. This is a very common presentation come to you. Being emergency physicians, we are always looking at these sort of cases in open-minded way rather than uh, focusing into a specific particular diagnosis. We are thinking in a way that what could be the worst possible thing that can happen to this patient. So in case, uh, if this kind of patient comes to you, you need to investigate and need to plan patient's management. Uh, once patient come, comes to emergency department, we need to think whether this patient can send home. If not, whether this patient needs admission. If so, which unit this patient belongs. From the emergency department, this patient should be directed to the right specialty. Otherwise, their proper management may get delayed. Basically, if this kind of patient comes, we'll do routine blood investigation, full blood, full blood count, electrolytes, and all. Um, this is obvious according to the history that this is a seizure attack. Uh, our traditional uh, approach is, um, so uh, we'll do basic blood investigation. Um, if this kind of patient comes to emergency department, we'll do a venous blood gas to see whether there are any correctable uh, causes. Um, and uh, in addition to that, this is the first episode of seizures. Most of us definitely proceed with the CT brain to exclude possible intracranial pathology. Um, this patient, uh, in addition to that, uh, we'll do a ECG. 
so this patient um, talking and he was well looking. So we did the ECG. Yeah, this is the ECG. I'll give you a few seconds to go through the ECG. The conventional practice was to admit this patient to a medical ward or a neurology unit. Can somebody pause um, what could be the ECG, what could be the ECG findings? Basics are, <coughs> basics, are basics, uh, which level you are practicing. Uh, Yes, uh, Classic has given an answer exactly correct. This is a Brugada type ECG, which should not be missed by a medical officer. Um, ECG basics, basically you need to uh, look at the ECG, confirm patient's identity, then you need to uh, look at the um, heart rate, uh, ECG rhythm, axis, uh, P waves, QRS complexes, and T waves, um, and specific intervals, and you need to look for is there any specific abnormal waves present in the ECG. These are the basic approach into any kind of ECG. So here, in case, uh, we got the clear diagnosis from uh, one of the doctors. This is a Brugada type ECG. Uh, so Brugada syndrome diagnosis is mainly depend on characteristic ECG findings and clinical criteria. Uh, Brugada syndrome is first discovered in 1992 by Brugada brothers. Um, and uh, it's a sodium, it's a genetical disorder running in families due to sodium channel mutation. Um, the mean age of presentation is 41 years, but there are reported cases from uh, two days to age 44, sorry, age 84. So this is the characteristic uh, Brugada sign in ECG. You can see uh, lead V1 and V2, uh, right, uh, forward ST segment uh, elevation more than two millimeters uh, of uh, V1 to V3 followed by a negative T wave pattern. This, is, this doesn't confirm Brugada syndrome, but it's a potentially diagnostic of Brugada syndrome. What happened if you miss this uh, during first presentations, sometimes uh, this patient may not come to us again. Sometimes we'll get the dead body if we develop dangerous cardiac arrhythmia. There is a Brugada type one. It, Brugada has described as, uh, describes in three types. Brugada type two, described as um, ST segment elevation uh, with more than two millimeters with saddle back pattern. You can clearly see that there's a saddle back pattern. If this is present, this is, uh, this is a uh, type two Brugada pattern uh, ECG. Uh, then the type three is described as um, uh, either type one, that means cold ST segment elevations with T wave inversion, um, or saddleback appearance is more than two millimeter ST segment elevation, uh, that pattern. Uh, but uh, in type three, it could be either, but height is less than two millimeter, um, height is less than uh, two millimeter of the ST segment. Um, so ECG, ECG changes can be transient with Brigada syndrome and can also be unmasked or augmented by multiple factors. If these changes, uh, uh, most of the time, these changes may present with fever, myocardial ischemia, use of multiple medications, uh, hypokalemia, uh, hypothermia, or post, even post-DC cardioversion also, this uh, signs can, sign can be appeared. Uh, Brugada sign in isolation is a questionable significance. ECG abnormality must be associated with one of the following clinical criteria to make the diagnosis. If there, if there is documented ventricular fibrillation or morpholo, mo, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, if there's a history of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, um, or family history of sudden cardiac death at age less than 45 years of age, or cold type ECGs in family members, inducible VT with uh, programmed electrical stimulation, which should be done in a cath lab, or a patient may present a syncope or nocturnal agonal respiration. Uh, if these ECG findings combined with, combined with one of these, then can come to a diagnosis that this patient is having Brugada syndrome. In these patients, uh, as I told you from the beginning, we were 
open minded uh, we wanted to exclude subarachnoid hemorrhage intracranial bleeding so we did a ct brain it was normal and uh, we further got advice from a neurologist um, eeg was normal and this patient was referred to electrophysiologist for further management and diagnosis i think you all make clear about uh, brugada syndrome i hope you will never miss if you get uh, this kind of presentation in future then i'm moving to the case 2 36 year old male sri lankan living in australia returned home country for surgery and further management of his recently diagnosed bowel cancer while he was investigating as outpatient one week later developed chest pain and mild shortness of breath he was seen by family doctor he had suspicious ecg sent directed to district general hospital his troponin was positive and treated with enoxaparin for 3 days with diagnosis of non stemi and discharge home Three weeks later, he developed severe chest pain and shortness of breath. On arrival to hospital, found dead. What have we missed? We went through the first one of findings. The concern is, does all chest pain is MI? If we exclude MI, are they safe? From as I told you from the beginning, we should be open-minded and we need to think in the way of possible worst possibilities. If we can rule out these all worst possibilities. uh we can uh, rule out uh, dangerous presentations and uh, then we can we can do a safe discharge even from the emergency department i'm get i can see that i'm getting a correct response from you all into chat box uh this is the ecg pattern what we saw in these patients uh we could see uh classic uh, s1 uh, q3 uh, t3 pattern with right bundle branch block um, so uh, actually this patient's post mortem findings was pulmonary embolism it was a massive pulmonary embolism uh, this patient had a lot of risk factors pulmonary embolism is not um, come to the screen uh, and we are not uh, giving much contribution uh, much suspicion on pulmonary embolism most of the time it's underdiagnosed uh, so if we go through the classic ecg findings of pulmonary embolism 44% may have sinus tachycardia uh, they may have a complete or incomplete right bundle branch block uh, then right ventricular strain pattern uh, right axis deviation dominant r wave in b1 uh, right atrial enlargement s1 q3 t3 pattern which is very common and if we ask what is ecg finding this is the answer what we are giving but we can see it only among 20% of patients 20% of patient due to the change of the cardiac position uh, clockwise rotation can be seen they can present with cardiac arrhythmia the most interesting they may have completely normal ecg in 18% of patients so in this case this patient came with a chest pain with a lot of non specific ecg changes troponin is positive the diagnosis directed toward non stemi during the during hospital stay this is not a massive pulmonary embolism this patient got a cover with enoxaparin uh, but patient never had uh, uh, anticoagulation so this patient again presented with massive pulmonary embolism and died always we need to be open minded being being troponin positive it's not heart attack is not the only cause to become troponin to positive so they can have myocardial infarction in case troponin can uh, become positive so it could be type 1 due to atheromatous plaque rupture or type 2 myocardial infarction uh, extreme hypertension anemia vasospasm can cause type 2 uh, myocardial infarctions while they are having a uh, normal coronary arteries so there are a lot of other causes for positive troponin um, acute and chronic heart failure myocarditis cardiac contusion from trauma cardioversion um aortic dissection uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and lot more causes for positive troponin these are the cardiac causes but there are a lot of other non cardiac causes also for positive troponin which include uh, renal failure pulmonary embolism severe pulmonary hypertension sepsis severe critical illness burns ex even extreme exertion can cause raised troponin levels stroke even subarachnoid hemorrhage also patient can get uh, elevated troponin levels 
when interpreting a context of this sort of background, you have to be very careful whether it's a myocardial infarction or not. So the most important thing in patient management is the history. Um, you need to take detailed history. It's obvious that this patient had a long haul AI journey. Roughly, uh, it will take about 10 hours to 10. It could be a 10 hours AI travel to Sri Lanka. She had a, this patient had an underlying malignancy. Uh, those are high risk factors for pulmonary embolism. Uh, the gold standard test to diet confirm pulmonary embolism is CT pulmonary angiogram, but uh, in our setting it's uh, difficult, but when I was practicing overseas, if we suspect pulmonary embolism, straight away patient is going to CT room, no steroid uh, process, straight away they are doing uh, CT pulmonary angiogram while giving contrast and we can confirm diagnosis then and there. If diagnosis is delayed, patient may end up with uh, devastating consequences. Always risk stratification is very must. Uh, and uh, for imaging another diagnosis, you can use diagnostic tools, which is I'm not going to describe. Uh, describe. Um, so common diagnostic uh, criteria we are using is uh, Wells criteria and per criteria. Uh, this is just highlight, this is just an eye-opening uh, uh, discussion on pulmonary embolism. I expect you all to read around this, how to diagnose and what, how to uh, rule out pulmonary embolism criteria and when to uh, go for imaging. You need to read and understand this. So the next case, case three. 46 years old female presented with GP with uh, fever, severe pain and rash on her left foot. She has a history of type two diabetes mellitus. GP diagnosed cellulitis, started coamoxiclave, paracetamol, femidine, and some other unknown tablets. Uh, we couldn't find what other tablets. This was her foot. You can clearly see that it is reddish, swollen, and um, I felt it warm. Uh, and patient had excruciating pain compared to the uh, lesion over her foot. This patient went home and this patient with, with antibiotics and early morning this patient was admitted to hospital. Patient was tachypneic, hypotensive, acidotic. We did vigorous fluid resuscitation, ICU admissions, multiple surgeries, prolonged hospital stay, rehabilitation and sent home after about three months. What could be the diagnosis? Um, it's not erysipelas. If it is erysipelas, obvious this is a sepsis. This obvious sepsis. Exactly, uh, this is uh, necrotizing fasciitis, neck fasci. This is after uh, wound toilet. She got a, um, this much uh, wound debridement. So diagnosis was uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Um, the classic feature is necrotizing, necrotizing fasciitis, patients coming with excruciating pain compared to the uh, redness in their foot. It's an unbearable severe pain. Uh, and other thing is, according to his, you need to assess the risk factors, you need to have a high degree of suspicion. Necrotizing fasciitis is common among immunosuppressed patients. Uh, those who are having chronic kidney disease, uh, diabetes, um, uh, on immunosuppressive therapy, it's very common among them. This is rapidly progressive disease. Usually this is polymicrobial. You need sepsis kills patient, uh, so you need to have a diagnosis early. These patients need early and anti vigorous antibiotic treatment to control uh, disease spread. And if extensive tissue necrosis is there, patient need wound debridement. At presentation, sometimes you may feel uh, uh, crepitations uh, due to underlying gas formation, uh, underlying gas formation inside the tissues. If you use ultrasound, you may see a gas among tissue planes or if you do a CT, you can clearly see uh, gas uh, bubbles uh, among tissue planes. They need empiric treatment. Uh, so antibiotic of choice is meropenem and clindamycin. Uh, you need to take blood culture and all formal uh, septic shock manage, sepsis, sepsis management. Um, and uh, don't delay antibiotic. Antibiotic, you need to give early antibiotics. Um, what our practice is uh, if patient comes with cellulitis, uh, we'll mark the area with a permanent marker and observe whether this um, cellulitis, the redness is spreading beyond the uh, marker lines uh, towards the other area very rapidly. Within four hours, uh, if it is rapidly spreading, we'll take this as necrotizing fasciitis and we'll admit this patient. 
uh, we'll treat them with uh, antib strong antibodies and they need vigorous uh, antibiotic treatment. So even with appropriate uh, antibiotic therapy, their mortality is around 30 to 40%. So then I'm moving to uh, case number four. So 17 years old boy awaiting school marathon presented to GP with ECG uh, for, to assess fitness for the marathon. ECG seen by the GP and said he is apparently well fit for marathon. At the fifth kilometer, post child collapse, found dead by paramedics. What happened? This is the ECG. Yes, uh, Dr. Akandawal, it's clear this is a cardiomyopathy, case of cardiomyopathy. Um, this, this kind of di you should not miss this kind of diagnosis. Uh, you should be aware of uh, classic ECG findings of uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So then if you go through the ECG, you can clearly see that uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, R wave height is R V6 R wave height plus V1 uh, S wave height is exceeding more than five large squares, confirm left ventricular hypertrophy. Then uh, you can see dragger like key waves in uh, inferior leads and uh, lateral leads. Um, so it, these key waves are different from infarcted key waves. Typically, they are uh, more than 40 milliseconds uh, infarcted ones, but septal key waves in Hocum are less than uh, 40 milliseconds. They can help be mitrally. Um, or the reason for death is um, cardiac precipitation of arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. So if you come across an ECG like this and uh, never miss uh, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, especially uh, young people. Um, so uh, this is one of the common cause for sudden death in young people. Uh, other causes are arrhythmogenic right ventricular arrhythmia and um, uh, Brugada syndrome. Uh, I suggest you all to read uh, about uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular rhythm, which is also a um, very important diagnosis uh, to prevent uh, sudden cardiac death. In um, so exertional syncope, or uh, they are presenting with pacing symptoms of presyncope. Uh, symptoms of pulmonary. They may have symptoms of pulmonary congestion. Uh, they are coming with chest pain and palpitation. So in this case, diagnosis is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I'm moving to the case number five. 64-year-old male patient with a history of bowel cancer presented with generalized malaise and lethargy. He had chemotherapy five days ago. GP prescribed paracetamol, augmentin, and pentaprazole, uh, and some more uh, white tablets. We couldn't uh, find what they are. Early morning patient was admitted with hypotension and reduced GCS, managed as septic shock according to the surviving sepsis guideline uh, with three inotropes to maintain MAP of 65. This patient was uh, admitted to ICU, found to have absolute neutrophil count of 300. This is a case of neutropenic sepsis where patient can die within hours. Um, neutropenic sepsis, uh, also called febrile neutropenia, uh, is defined as a single temperature measurement of more than 35 centigrade or a sustained temperature of uh, more than 38 centigrade for more than one hour in a patient with a decreased absolute neutrophil count less than 500. And sometimes immunosuppressed patients may present without fever. These, pa these, pa these patients' managements are uh, time critical management. Risk factors for febrile neutropenia are post chemotherapy, post transplantation, chronic granulomatous disease, even uh, clozapine induced granulocytosis also uh, can, patients also can go into febrile neutro neutropenia. Uh, neutropenic patients are at extreme risk of going into septic shock and death. Uh, do not neglect that these patients are having a malignancy uh, and they are ready to die. Uh, they are getting treatment with variable prognosis. So in case uh, treating doctors, we should deviate from prejudice and we need to look after these people. Especially those who had chemotherapy, they are at a greater chance of, greater chance of going into uh, febrile neutropenia. It's a time critical management. You need to give IV antibiotics. You, you need to follow uh, surviving sepsis guideline management criteria. Uh, 
and uh, they need early uh, antibiotic treatment. Uh, antibiotic, uh, empirical antibiotic uh, choice is um, piperacillin and tazobactam. Before blood, uh, before antibiotics, you need to take uh, uh, blood cultures in case if it is delaying more than five minutes, you better start antibiotics uh, before blood cultures. They need reverse barrier nursing. What reverse barrier nursing is, we need to prevent patient getting infection from us. Not from the, not from patient healthcare worker. Patient get can get infections from um, healthcare workers. Therefore, the ideal this kind of patient should be managed in a positive pressure uh, isolation room for the safety of the patients. Always, if a patient with a malignancy uh, or post chemotherapy coming with uh, generalized malaise, even without fever, you need to strongly suspect possible neutrophenic sepsis. Um, till blood count available, you need to start antibiotics. If blood count comes as less than 500, you need to treat as uh, uh, neutrophenic sepsis. But if white cell uh, neutrophil count is more than 500, then you need to act accordingly. Uh, you can get rid of the diagnosis of neutrophenic sepsis. So I'm moving to my uh, final case. Uh, these days, vaccination campaigns are very common. You are facing these kind of uh, cases. Um, you need to. Uh, be up to date on management of these kind of cases. Um, so this case is 56 year old previously healthy female suddenly collapsed at salon while using hair dye. It's obvious. Yes, I'm getting a lot of answers. Uh, on admission to emergency department, she had gasping bleeding with blood pressure of uh, 60 by 40, pulse rate 130, hardly any air entry on both lung field with oxygen saturation of 76. She had warm peripheries with um, flushed appearance. It's clear that all doctors can diagnose anaphylaxis. No doubt, this is a clearly anaphylactic case of anaphylaxis. So even though we have diagnosed anaphylaxis, uh, we need to strictly adhere to the diagnostic criteria in this case. I wanted to highlight uh, how it differ from um, allergic reaction and uh, uh, the definition of uh, anaphylactic reaction. What is anaphylaxis? Anaphylaxis is highly likely when any one of the following three criteria are fulfilled. I'm going to describe one by one these criteria. So, acute onset of an illness, minutes to several hours, uh, with involvement of the skin, mucosal tissues, or both. This could be generalized hives, uritis, flushing, swollen lip and tongue uvula, and at least one of the following respiratory compromise, reduced blood pressure or associated symptoms of endorgan dysfunction. That means hypotonia, syncope, or incontinence. If patient with onset of acute illness with involvement of skin, mucosal tissues with respiratory compromise, or reduced blood pressure, we will take this as anaphylaxis. Other set of criteria, two or more of the following that occur rapidly after exposure to likely allergen. Involvement of skin mucosal tissues, respiratory uh, compromise, reduced blood pressure or associated symptoms. In this case, uh, patient had all patient has fulfilled all criteria. So uh, hair dye is well known that a lot of people died after exposure to uh, hair dye. Uh, non allergen is there. Uh, respiratory compromise was there, even hypertension, hypotension also there, then this case is clearly, according to definition, it's a clearly anaphylaxis. Then the third criteria is reduce blood pressure after exposure to non-allergen. Those who are allergic, if accidentally got penicillin injection, drop blood pressure, it's anaphylaxis. Infant and children, if they present their low blood pressure uh, defined for their age, if it is um, greater than 30% decrease in systolic, uh, we consider these infants are uh, a hypotensive. For adults, systolic blood pressure less than 90 or greater than 30% decrease from uh, that person's baseline blood pressure. Sometimes they may have uncontrolled elevated uh, high blood pressures. If their blood pressure is low from 30% from the baseline, we will take uh, their hypotensive. These are the three criteria described to uh, diagnose anaphylaxis. So those who are having anaphylaxis fatality can occur within minutes if a patient stands 
walk or sit suddenly. Patient must not walk or stand even if they appear to have recovered. So these are the correct position. If patient is having a respiratory compromise, uh, while patient maintaining normal blood pressure, you can keep patient like this. But if they are hypotensive, patient should lie flat to maintain vital organ perfusion. Uh, if baby is if a baby is having anaphylaxis, uh, they should not keep in upright position on shoulder. The baby should lie flat. If patient is vomiting and uh, risk of aspiration, even you can keep them in left lateral position. Do do not the the important message is do not um, uh, keep them stand uh, may end up with devastating outcome. So structured approach for any emergency is necessary. Structured ATCD approach always we are telling this mantra, but uh, we reluctant to follow this approach. Uh, why we are following this approach A B C D uh, that we need to address killing things first. So if patient is still with the allergen, you need to remove. Uh, for example, wasp attack, you need to remove all the uh, things. Uh, emergencies cannot manage alone always. You need to work as a team. In emergency department, uh, we are doing, um, uh, uh, we are doing, uh, uh, we are having a pre-allocated roles for the uh, uh, staff like uh, resuscitation doctor, airway nurse, circulation nurse. Uh, in, if we are getting emergency, this team is involved in with, uh, resuscitation with pre-allocated roles. So if your patient is having anaphylaxis, um, uh, this patient need to lay flat. Uh, do not allow them to stand or walk. Uh, do not hold infant upright. If breathing difficulty, allow them to sit. So anaphylaxis, First line treatment is adrenaline. First line treatment is adrenaline. You don't have time to speak to your seniors. You don't have time to speak to your consultants. You need to manage then and there. You need to give adrenaline. First line treatment is adrenaline. So adrenaline dose must be at your fingertips. We all doctors should remember this adrenaline dose. Uh, we are giving adrenaline one in thousand, 0.5 ml. We can go up to three doses of adrenaline intramuscularly. This can be given into the lateral aspect of the mid thigh. Pediatric dose is one in thousand, 0 0.01 ml per kg maximum, 0.5 ml. So this is very easy to remember. All adrenaline, Sri Lanka adrenaline wires comes in one in thousand. Each vial contain uh, one ml. So what you need to do is break the vial, get the half vial. If you, if you have difficulty in remembering numbers, break the vial, get the half of the uh, vial and give it intramuscularly if you suspect anaphylaxis. Delay the treatment, um, worse outcome. So if patient is having, you need to have obvious two white bow cannula when you are at the level of uh, assessing circulation. Um, you need to give IV fluid, a choice of fluid is 0.9% saline. You can give 20 ml per kg or maximum uh, 50 ml per kg within 30 minutes uh, if patient is not responding to adrenaline. Um, so uh, for an adult, uh, you can go up to uh, three liters if they are not having any other comorbid diseases. Um, if no improvement with, uh, no improvement after three doses of uh, IM adrenaline, you need to go for adrenaline infusion. It is easy to remember in other countries what they are describing is uh, one mile into one liter of saline. Our salines come in 500 ml, so you need to give half vial of uh, adrenaline. Need to mix with 500 ml of saline. You can titrate this 5 ml per kg per hour, then patient is getting 0.1 micrograms per kg per minute. This is easy to remember, half vial into one uh, pint of saline, uh, starting dose is uh, 5 ml per kg per hour. You need to titrate adrenaline infusion um, according to the response. Uh, the, the problem with this uh, infusion is uh, you are giving diluted large volume, uh, they may end up with fluid load, fluid overload. So to prevent fluid overload, uh, you need to uh, set up a proper uh, uh, adrenaline uh, infusion. This uh, 0.5 ml in 500 ml of saline is set up for pre-hospital care or in a situation where if you are not having infusion pumps. But if you are having infusion pump, you can, you can give uh, 
concentrated uh, adrenaline infusion, the protocol for 100 ml of normal saline is as follows. So you need to mix uh, 1 ml of uh, 1 in 1000 adrenaline. That means 1 mile into 100 ml of uh, normal saline. Initial rate adjusted according to, uh, accordingly to 0.5 ml per kg per hour. If you are giving 0.5 ml, so patient is getting 1 micrograms per kg per minute. Should only be given by infusion pump, not by the burette sets. This is how you prepare adrenaline infusion if your patient is not responding to uh, three intramuscular doses of adrenaline. So there are additional measures to consider if your patient, um, if adrenaline infusion is ineffective, so a patient may present with strido, airway of features of uh, airway obstruction. You need to nebulize with the adrenaline, pure adrenaline. Uh, you need to take five vials of adrenaline and uh, nebulize with adrenaline, which may relieve upper airway obstruction. For persistent hypotension, hypotension or shock, you can give fluid up to 50 ml per kg per kg per uh, 50 ml per kg, uh, you need to load it within 30 minutes. So you need to give fast fluid, you need to resuscitate this patient very fast. So persistent bees, they may have very tight lungs, so you need to use uh, bronchodilators. Um, you can use salbutamol puffers, especially these, they, they space, we are getting suspected uh, or undiagnosed COVID patients in those sort of a situation rather than the nebulization. If you can give salbutamol puffers with MDI, uh, patient, you need to prescribe 12 puffs, 12 puffs of 100 microgram salbutamol. Or you need to nebulize patients with uh, 5 milligram of uh, salbutamol mixed with saline. So 12 puffs of salbutamol uh, MDI is equal to a single nebulization. Uh, you can use corticosteroids. Um, you need you should give uh, oral prednisolone one milligram per kg maximum up to fifty milligram or intravenous hydrocortisone five milligram per kg maximum two hundred. I have seen a lot of people are giving hundred milligram uh, to sorry four hundred milligram, but desired dose is two hundred milligram is sufficient. In patient with cardiogenic shock, especially if taking beta blockers, consider an intravenous uh, glucagon bolus. Uh, this is most of the time this is not available in our hospital setup. Um, you, if it is available, uh, you need to use uh, glucagon uh, initially one to two milligram for adult, and um, 30 to uh, 20 to 30 microgram per kg up to one milligram in children. This may be repeated or followed by an infusion, uh, one to two milligram per hour in adults. Um, in adults, severe uh, vasoconstrictors. In adults, we can use selective vasoconstrictors like metramidone or vasopressin only after advice from emergency medicine consultant or critical care specialist. Metramidone doses, 10 microgram per kg dose, uh, can be used to constrict their vessels. Caution, intravenous boluses of adrenaline is not recommended uh, due to risk of cardiac ischemia or arrhythmia unless the patient is in cardiac arrest. Uh, IM adrenaline would be the best thing for anaphylaxis. Uh, but there's a um, IV adrenaline. Uh, I have seen people use IV adrenaline, but uh, uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, the recommendation is uh, IM adrenaline for anaphylaxis. Uh, no direct IV adrenaline boluses because uh, um, undiluted uh, higher dose of adrenaline may lead to cardiac arrhythmia. So antihistamines. Antihistamines have no role in treating or preventing respiratory or cardiovascular systems of anaphylaxis. Do not use oral sedating antihistamine as side effects. Mimic signs of uh, deteriorating anaphylaxis. Injectable promethazine, earlier we used it's no longer recommended. Patient may develop drowsiness and sometimes uh, intramuscular, uh, sometimes uh, muscle necro cases of muscle necrosis has been reported. So corticosteroids, uh, the benefit of uh, corticosteroids in anaphylaxis is unproven. Um, there's no proven benefit, but we are still, it's in the guideline. So um, the, the other important component is disposition. 
those who got adrenaline we need to monitor minimum for four hours in the emergency department um, and uh, those who got multiple doses of adrenaline cannot be discharged from the emergency department they need to be observed for uh, to an overnight in the hospital because they can get a biphasic type of anaphylactic reactions therefore they need to be closely monitored while during their hospital stay so i have discussed six cases i believe that uh, you may got a sound idea of uh, common emergency the emergencies which present to emergency department with possibilities of missing or misdiagnosis um so i have discussed these cases to highlight what you need you need to give attention and uh, i due to uh, limitation of time um i i have discussed few cases superficially so you need to read around read around these cases uh so uh, i got few questions um, into the chat box pediatric patients also you need to give adrenaline im uh Uh, IV adrenaline boluses are not recommended. I uh, mentioned, um, uh, and um, if you need to use IV adrenaline infusion if patient is not responding to three uh, adrenaline IM injections. Uh, one doctor is asking, uh, is it safe giving IM adrenaline following um, AVS or snake bite because risk of hematoma? But we can manage hematoma first thing is the life if anaphylaxis management is delayed patient may die so first thing is life uh, rather than the uh, limb or the wherever the place you are going to save if patient is going into anaphylaxis uh, better uh, you need to go ahead with the rather than thinking of hematoma later we can uh, if it is infected or whatever we can uh, manage those things first thing you need to save the life uh, um i think uh, one doctor is asking whether it's possible to get a uh, uh, video of this uh, lecture you need to contact sri office uh, and uh, verify from them they are, i think they are recording this uh, uh, lecture uh, uh, another doctor is asking why for before a viper bite of course anyway we need to give a uh, uh, im rather than thinking about uh, hematoma because it is a life saving thing um especially in peripheral settings uh, adrenaline boluses are not recommended this is the latest guideline uh, practice in uh, australia uh, one doctor is asking whether there is a specific method to diagnose necrotizing fasciitis um, specific method there are no specific investigation it's a clinical history history and examination is very important the classic feature is they are getting excruciating pain compared to the um, redness of the skin sometimes you may feel gas and the tissue planes uh, and this is very rapidly spreading if you mark it with the marker it very quickly it crosses borders and spread very rapidly yes um, um, well, is there any role of vasopressin you need to uh, go with metronidazole or vasopressin uh, with uh, uh, with the um, uh, consultation of uh, either emergency physician or critical care expert resistance cases of course you can use vasopressin uh, one doctor is asking why preferred uh, why prefer thai uh, rather than the deltoid in pediatrics uh, better sometimes uh, they are having very uh, small muscle mass um, uh, therefore uh, thai would be preferred uh, using uh, but general recommendation is you need to give intramuscular injection another doctor is asking still antibiotic test dose are given so during my overseas practice no penicillin sensitivity was observed uh, we'll get patient's history whether you are allergic to this medication uh, if patient is allergic uh, we don't give uh, if patient is not allergic straight away we'll give uh, antibiotic if patient develop anaphylaxis we cannot predict so uh, if patient develop anaphylaxis we'll manage them uh, and anaphylaxis is not dose dependent But even a test dose is sufficient to develop anaphylaxis there are a lot of reported cases of anaphylaxis after giving a test dose um another doctor is asking whether it's uh, take more than 24 hours to develop anaphylaxis um general consensus is less than 24 hours but uh, those are general uh, those are uh, observation but extreme cases may present 
it, it's a difficult question and cannot give answer. Uh, sometimes they may present. Uh, most of the uh, medications and things get absorbed uh, less than 24 hours time. And if they are developing anaphylaxis, most of the time they develop uh, anaphylaxis. But I'm not sure. I, 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 I didn't find any uh, case report uh, anaphylaxis develop after 24 hours. Uh, is it recommended to give multiple doses of adrenaline in field practice? Wherever the place you need to save, save the life. In case uh, you need to give uh, three doses of adrenaline uh, to see if your patient is not responding. Uh, and uh, so I described you that uh, pre-hospital um, um, low, low uh, volume, I'm sorry, high volume uh, diluted adrenaline infusion uh, if patient is not responding to three doses of uh, adrenaline. Wherever the place you need to, uh, no matter where, where, whether you are in a field or wherever the place you need to manage anaphylaxis then and there. That's why I told, uh, no, uh, you can't, you don't have time to get uh, your senior colleagues opinion or no, all if it is anaphylaxis, yes, you need to manage it then and there. Uh, think if it is not anaphylaxis, what can happen? If your patient doesn't have an ischemic heart disease, what happens is with a single dose of adrenaline, their heart rate goes up and it may come down. With a single dose, they may go on into, uh, with an intramuscular dose, they may not go into dangerous cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, single dose may cause only elevation of heart rate and it may come back. If you have a doubt, give adrenaline and um, save lives. If regard a suspicious patient, what is the next management? This pa these patients should be directed to uh, electrophysiologists. If you don't have electrophysiologist facilities in your hospital, uh, direct them to cardiologists. Then cardio cardiologists will do necessary echocardiogram, heart monitoring, and then they will direct them to uh, electrophysiologist. Refractory anaphylaxis. Uh, there are no first fluid, first adrenaline refractory anaphylaxis. Uh, you need to manage anaphylaxis uh, in horizontal approach. You need to start fluid. You need to start adrenaline. You need to give fluid um, up to 50 ml per kg uh, in a half an hour's time. And uh, if not responding, um, if your patient is not responding, you need to go for adrenaline infusion, even with that if patient is not responding, depending on patient's condition, if on beta blockers, you need to give glucagon and all. Uh, and uh, even you can use metraminol uh, in refractory cases. Uh, exactly how long it takes to act a steroid. Steroid will take roughly about uh, three to four hours to get maximum action. So for an emergency management of anaphylaxis, steroid is not the first line treatment. Adrenaline is the first line treatment. Still people are reluctant to give adrenaline. They have a fear of arrhythmia, but if no ischemic heart disease, you can give adrenaline to save patients' lives. Um, one doctor has asked, is there a place for hydroxyethylene uh, starch in management of sepsis? Clearly, no. Starches have no place in management of critically ill patients or critically bleeding patients. Uh, there are a lot of case reports and research has proven um, starches may lead into a renal impairment and worse outcome. Uh, hydroxy starches should not be used. Only situation where using starch is uh, dengue shock patients, if they are not responding to uh, fluids, uh, if we want to preserve fluid quota, we will give uh, big strand. That is the only thing we are using in our practice. So I'll stop at uh, this point. And if you have further questions, please email to me. I'll uh, email you all. My, uh, I'll uh, post my email address on uh, chat box. Um, so uh, finally, what I want to highlight here is a high degree of clinical suspicion is important before come to a final judgment. Always seek expert advice in case of doubt. Uh, I would like to give my special thank to Government Medical Officers Association uh, and the three staff of Sri Office and uh, your kind part, your patient uh, participation of this presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that informative presentation. And thank you for enlightening with our queries. And I would like to thank Dr. Tushar Patin for his excellent presentation on behalf of GMOA and Tree Knowledge Academy.